Hi, hi. We're we're uh, we're hi. joined by an extra special guest today. We have uh, uh, the uh, uh, Mujer de las Flores here. <laughs> this is the uh, surprise surprise guest for everybody joining us here um, for uh, social sparks a conversation here uh, with Grand Park. I'm Mark Frosty McNeil of Dub Lab. I'm in Los Angeles, and we're actually uh, this is now officially an international conversation which is exciting tanya aguiniga where are you right now um i'm in oaxaca city so i was lucky enough to be able to get away a little bit for my friend's 50th birthday so i come home tomorrow that's a place where celebrations are on the street you know all the time i, I recall my time spent in Oaxaca, you know, you, you don't have to look for, for entertainment and excitement. It's just there. It's so rich and vibrant. But this the culture of celebration is something that's really public. You know, it's I know that's private as well, but there's a lot of, you know, street celebrations. And have you encountered some of that uh, celebratory spirit publicly on your trip? It's been a little a little more quiet than usual, you know, because of COVID. Um, but there was a procession of big paper mache, um, you know, people walking past this window that I'm looking out from. Um, and then there was women carrying these really beautiful flower arrangements. So, so yeah, so it's, it's pretty amazing. And that's, you know, with your kind of work, you know, so much of what you're focused on is really kind of making from the soul, but also channeled through your hands and that kind of physical experience as an artist, you know, what, whether it's weaving or working with pottery or any other materials, it is very much a, a physical experience. There we see one right now um, from a show at Volume Gallery on the screen. What, what is that piece? So that piece is um, a knit rope piece that I made um, using ice dye, which is a, a weird kind of like experimental dyeing technique um, where you cover the material with ice and then sprinkle pigments that haven't been mixed um, onto the top and it kind of creates this watercolor effect. Um, but I made it during the pandemic uh, and it was my first show during the pandemic. Um, and so I had to make work while homeschooling kids and trying to figure out um, how to make pieces that were manageable so that if anybody was to purchase it, that they could also, you know, install it themselves. But a really big part of that exhibition was to focus on joy and to think about, you know, like the difficulties that we were all going through the whole last, you know, year and a half and really think about um, about ways of, of using color to bring some a little bit of joy and like a reprise from you know, all of the heaviness of the pandemic. Yeah, definitely. You know, it has been heavy, but I think a reinforcement of what's important and, you know, being able to kind of amplify the things that are most important is really crucial. You know, it seems that, um, you know, the, the in a way, time has kind of gone so fast, but also so slow crept by and we've had a chance to kind of turn over, you know, these priorities in our head and continue to kind of reassess and, and think about those things that are integral. And I know that for you, your work's so personal, but it's also tied, you know, like all of us, you know, we're not just these kind of bubbles, you know, that exist separate from the world. We're all tied. And in fact, you know, nothing kind of better illustrates that than a pandemic because, you know, you're literally having this, you know, virus that's spreading. But I think that the idea of interconnectivity in a positive way is also important. What can we put out there and what are the good things we can spread? And celebration spectrum really kind of came out of that, you know, came out of spreading this idea of joy and, and you know, kind of not, not as much mourning what's missed, but celebrating the spirit that carries us forward in many ways. Um, should we should we check out a little clip, maybe a video clip of the celebration spectrum? So if people are joining us, you know, they and haven't seen the installation at Grand Park, they can kind of get a glimpse at it. Maybe we'll float that up and, and give people a first person look at it. So that's one of the first things you see, these amazing wigs, which are hilarious and, and beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah, think so that's one of the first things you thought about. 
Yeah, I think it is one of the first things we thought about. And um, I don't know if you if we should go into it now, but um, yeah, Mark and I started thinking about this project um, and Dub Lab had been thinking about reflection and what that means and what it means for people to see themselves reflected in art. Um, you know, art being this thing that for a lot of people is really um, like stigmatized. It's, it, it makes you feel like if you don't have you know, an education in art or something like that, that you can't really access it. Um, and so a lot of it was kind of about demystifying art and letting people see themselves literally reflected in pieces around the park. Um, and then immediately I started thinking about um, just the joy that comes from just laughing um, and how to think about making pieces that would just spark laughter and, you know, make you kind of wonder about the like, the ridiculousness of some stuff. Um, and so, so they're um, mirrors that are angled for you to be able to see yourself, but they have these really bright colored hair extensions on them so that you immediately kind of are transported into this alternate world of, of kind of like surreal, like happiness and, and strange, um, yeah, I guess kind of, yeah, be transported to a different place. And so that was kind of our lead in into thinking about parties and celebrations and this idea of a deconstructed party. And it kind of flows across, you know, the expanse of the park. And I think that, you know, it's interesting sometimes in kind of art projects and pieces, there's things that can be very visceral and live on the level, but you know, they can also go deeper if somebody wants to travel deeper with the kind of concepts behind it. And I think that that sort of piece, the, the mirror, you know, that, that is vibrant and, and humorous as well. You don't have to have an experience in kind of really, yeah, knowing about, you know, art history or theory, any of this stuff. You just can connect with it on whatever level, whatever you're bringing to the piece is, is great. In fact, it's actually welcomed and the piece is not complete until your image is there in a way. So it's really beautiful to be able to have that kind of idea of welcoming people in, celebrating. I was there in the park yesterday and and we're hearing also attached to these mirrors or these voices of, of artists who immediately are welcoming the public into the work and saying like, you know, what took you so long? We're so glad you're here. You're looking good, baby. And like really humorous, fun ideas of welcome, welcoming people in, but also these kind of secret, you know, you don't expect a voice to pop out. You, you don't expect first a mirror with beautiful, long, funny, vibrant hair to be in the tree. But then suddenly to have the tree talk to you is another thing. And so yesterday we were seeing some double takes of people looking over their shoulders and hearing voices. And I think that, you know, there's been a lot to mull over and a lot for people to think about. And that can be good, but it can also be counterproductive to mental health to constantly dwell on stuff. So like sort of like being able to present the theme and giving people an escape from it is really nice you know so i think humor is a, a beautiful tool i don't know if you guys and can hear but there's a there's a massive live band that i think is doing a parade very close to me um, so Amazing. if you hear yeah a lot of music i think how, it's yeah how, a how portable are you are, are you portable um, enough to point at the window we can uh we can i this think they're let me see. Let's. It's also ringing. Bring people it's also not in Amazing. So we get to see a the bunch of cars outside um, because I think the street is blocked by the procession. Um, yeah. Can you guys still? Can you still hear me? Okay, Mike. I can hear you all right, and we could hear those kind of like distant kind of thundering drums, and I think that it's it's nice to think about yeah you know, these public spaces used for celebration and. You know, again, with Celebration Spectrum, you know, we're offering up a space for anybody not only to see a bit of themselves in it or their culture, but also, you know, to make your own tradition and kind of like what happens when you mix traditions. Um, and we've seen some interesting things happening in the space where people are, you know, kind of uh, creating their own way of interacting, whether it's, you know, making up their own dance moves to you know, having a wedding or other ceremony, you know, in that space. We saw also these beautiful 
uh, balloons. Can you can you explain the the kind of mylar balloons that were shown in that video and and what those represent? Yeah, um, and so I guess we can kind of talk about like the the concept for the entire installation um, because yeah. Grand Park wanted us to take over like one whole city block and to kind of have like different points of activation. So it wasn't um, going to just be like a, a one, you know, small section. Um, and so then in thinking of like, what can we do with all these different um, sections? You know, the, the fountain obviously is a really big part of that block. Um, and it has so much of its own sound and so much of its own, I think, you know, memories. Um, and so we were, Mark and I were thinking about, you know, the idea of this deconstructed party. And so the, the part with the mirrors is the part that is the like, like you're getting ready and you're about to get to the party. And so it's kind of like the, like the pre-party part and like introduction to like, okay, you're entering this very different space and it kind of cues you to like, okay, like don't believe your eyes. This is, you know, like something different. And then um, in the fountain, um, Mark and I were talking about, um, you know, how this the park is used a lot by the unhoused community. And it's also used a lot by people that work in all the different buildings. Um, but, oh, now I'm like starting to get wet. <laughs> but um, the park is used by a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And a lot of times it's a place of rest for people. And it's a place where you don't really want to have like really crazy things happening all the time because it might actually yes. interfere with someone's ability to, you know, take care of their own like bodily yep. needs, like sleeping. Um, and so we were also talking about technology and QR codes. And I just, my default is to kind of go into like more analog ways of thinking in a lot of my work. And so I wanted to think of like, how can we cue songs in people's brains um, in an analog way, but think of songs that, you know, aren't necessarily um, like not spell out like a whole, a whole um, lyric of a song, but words that just kind of already look funny or already look interesting on their own. And so then we um, then started researching vocables, which are words that, make sounds but they don't actually mean anything so like ooh la 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 stuff like that um and so that kind of became then an opportunity to to delve into you know songs from different cultures songs from different times um so things from like the 50s things from like the 90s so that we could kind of um bring a little bit of joy to like a large like swath of the population now there's thunder um, <laughs> I, this, so, is, this is perfect. It's like a most multi-century Grand Park public program we could ask for. This, this is incredible. You, you all didn't realize you're tuning into an international kind of uh, multi-century uh, celebration here. Yes. So, um, so yeah. So in the middle of the park, um, you know, thinking about the reflective, the reflective quality of the water itself, um, thinking about the fact that people couldn't actually use the the water play area uh, because of the pandemic. So then how can we kind of cover a really large amount? Um, and then that kind of also came into to my mind that, you know, I still have to home had to homeschool um, children at my studio and I couldn't really make something that was big enough to cover obviously a whole city block um, with like you know, a month's notice, like two months notice. Um, so then I started thinking about what could I do that kind of like keeps, you know, bring like building on the, the celebration aspect. <laughs> and um, what is something that I had never seen before, but that could also, um, you know, bring community together and act as kind of a, like COVID relief for businesses that were hit and um, be able to help people um, in the long run and create less waste um, as an installation. And so then I started thinking about, um, it's very large thunder. Uh, I started thinking about 
um, party supplies and how, you know, all of these different party supply stores, um, you know, a lot of places, I live in East LA and there's a lot of party supplies around me. And sadly, other than for funerals, um, there hasn't been a lot of business for people that, you know, that sell flowers, that sell, you know, event stuff. Um, and so then I started thinking about, you know, how beautiful it would be to, um, to just get as many party supplies as I could to help these small businesses in LA. Um, but then also to be able to, um, to make a lending library for when parties do return. And I think one of the, ¿Van a cerrar la puerta? Okay. Si quiere, déjela abierta y yo la puedo cerrar. Ajá, porque si no, y luego no se va a ver la luz. Y luego no, no, sí, gracias. You're, Sorry. you're someone's reminds me of like watching, watching news, you know, and seeing like, you know, like a war reporter or something, but you're sort of like a joy reporter. We're getting like the celebrations from the street on the scene in Oaxaca City. Tanya Aguiniga <laughs> celebrating joy. Tell us, Tanya, what, what have you learned about joy there? Tell us about all of the beautiful rituals and wonderful art, taste, sound, sights. Yes. Yeah. I have learned that joy is within you and it is always within you and you need to just learn how to call it up and how to embody it. Um, yeah. So, and, you know, I think <laughs> you're, tra you know, you're traveling to a space like Los Angeles has a large Oaxacan population. And so we're kind of, you know, we're, we're fortunate here to be able to culturally absorb those elements of joy that people that are, specific to a culture but then there's also the overlapping and the shared things that are kind of like the universal you know and i think that within this kind of project it's like how can you you know bring something that's welcoming and universal to to everyone and represent los angeles in a uh you know its full kind of dimension which is beautiful so uh we'll have looks like tanya will be back with us in a minute um but it's really kind of like sharing this kind of embrace of, you know, kind of a wide scale, wide spectrum celebration. The vocables, uh, when Tanya brought that up, I come from a music background. So for me, you know, Tanya was talking about vocables and that was really something that, that was, you know, almost the viewer is filling in the picture in their brain. You know, the music is playing in the, the viewer's mind. You know, if you see, you know, wap up, loop up, a wap bamboo. You know, like you see the words in these mylar balloons, but the music starts to float into your your mind. So it was like selecting song lyrics, vocable lyrics from songs that were also accessible and not so obscure that people would not know where they came from. They would be able to have a kind of an entry point, um, but kind of like the same thing. Like if you see yourself reflected in a mirror we're reflecting in people's minds, you know, like, so I, I love this idea that this art show is also kind of not only in the eyes of the beholder, but kind of like in the inner ear of the beholder. If somebody's walking through Grand Park, you know, and just passing through, they might come across, you know, the very first thing is Selena, you know, beady bomb bomb, like, like a beady beady bomb bomb. And I think that so you've got these people kind of playing these inner songs in their their minds, which is really beautiful. So we've moved to a cor courtyard, it looks like, which is uh, gorgeous. We're taking the full tour. How are things no, there, Tanya? No. I'm like in the kitchen area, but there's only one very small light. And I had to, yeah, this other, I was talking to you. I don't know if you could still hear me. I'll have to log on I again, I think. Yeah, we still hear you, and um, we're traveling through a Oaxacan uh, bed and breakfast right now uh, with the elements still there. I hear the gentle rain outside taking over from the thunderous uh, uh, lightning and thunder. Um, but yeah, it's really poetic. There's a little lightning. Um, it's really poetic to have you know this kind of piece with the the balloons, this kind of party mantras. You know, to have these kind of uh, snippets of you know sounds from songs you know that can then kind of play in people's kind of minds um and even if you don't know you know the kind of context of that it's beautiful to just 
be able to see it. I think that everything and the installation, you know, can just be experienced on that level of somebody's walking through. I like the idea of kind of, you know, Grand Park is right there in the Civic Center be between these kind of, uh, you know, uh, courthouses and, and kind of governmental buildings. And often I think that if you're in those spaces, you're often not dealing with joy on a, a constant level. I feel like in a court, joy is one of the lower, lower on the rung of experiences. So like if we can kind of catch somebody on their way to and from, you know, like a legal proceeding and bring a little joy into their lives. I think that that can be like a, a nice, you know, element to reflect on and expand on. So it's been really beautiful to be able to uh, showcase and share some of, uh, you know, emphasize joy and amplify joy, um, which Tanya does in her work on a, a constant level, which is really beautiful. Um, but maybe we could play. If I can Ooh, light look myself up on yes or no. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. The the artist uh, at, at work. Um, you know, and I think one of the first things when we went into Grand Park, um, you were in a place in Grand Park called Olive Court. And that's where the celebration mm -hmm. tapestry is. And you immediately were saying, like, this feels like a dance floor. It feels like kind of a central hub. Can you talk about like that feeling of like being in that space and what you kind of envisioned when you stood in that place and what kind of came to fruition? Yeah. So immediately when I, you know, like it kind of in the, in the middle of the park of that, that section of the park, um, you know, there's a big open cement space. And so I was like, Oh, this is the ballroom. And so then I kept yeah. thinking of it as a place for people, you know, to dance and kind of be together <laughs> Um, and so then there's these really nice posts that, you know, kind of frame it out with lights and with speakers on it. And so then immediately I was like, oh my God, I have to do something that's a canopy that goes over this area. Um, and I think part of um, like the really big surprise for me in, um, in the piece is I didn't think about in the beginning. Um, how so many times we don't see our like cultural party supplies next to party supplies from another culture, you know, and how much in a time of, you know, so much like political unrest and, and the need for equity and, and social justice, um, there was just something really beautiful about um, being able to see, you know, like something Chinese right next to something Mexican, you know, and some of those yeah. things, um, yeah like you just don't don't get i think a lot of opportunities for like visual intersectionality um yeah so anyway so then the space is really big and so then i thought about okay so how can i fill up you know a 50 foot space that's like 40 feet by 50 feet and so then a lot of it was just trying to get as many items as i could find um, from the different cultures that there are in LA and kind of go to all the different like sections of town that have, um, you know, like, like a, like little whatever town, like little, you know, like little <laughs> Ethiopia, <laughs> like, uh, my favorite. that's yeah. my favorite of the, the many Los Angeles <laughs> diasporas, the whateverians. Yeah. I mean, in a way we are all sort of whateverians. I mean, it's like, it's, we're influenced by everything we come in contact with. So we think of these things like wholly ourselves, but also such a mixture of things. And I think that's really beautiful. But yeah, sourcing totally. from the Ethiopias, the Filipino town, the little Tokyo, exactly. et cetera. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, and like little Armenia and all of these different, like really, really amazing parts of town. Um, yeah. And so then it was trying to get like as many things as possible and try to figure out, you know, how to get things that were gonna move really well, things that were gonna catch light. Um, but then within like me, like beginning to source those things and to think about um, all of the different communities, um, then we decided uh, at the studio to center 
to try to get as much stuff as we could from um, the Asian communities, just because of everything going on and, and kind of, you know, try to kind of recenter um, ourselves in our, in our city as a city that, that supports Asian communities and that has such a rich history of diverse yeah. um, cultures. And so then that's why there's, you know, a really massive dragon in the middle, um, which is then followed really nicely by um, all of these different um, fish, uh, codfish that, you know, catch the wind that um, are for, that you almost were for- like you're in a haunted house slightly, which is amazing. <laughs> I'm like, I'm getting a really good visual here. It's like, this is like watching, yeah, the best movie I've ever seen, Tanya in Oaxaca. And <laughs> it's really hilarious. Um, I could like, yeah. You see that like the creepy, let's see, I'll show you like the very beautiful, but maybe creepy like faces. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. We just need some like some organ music to start playing, some pipe organ to yeah. start playing and a door to creak open and we're we're set. Um, I know. you were talking you know, these, these, these fish, which one of the interesting things that kind of in the course of research and looking into the different kind of cultural artifacts and elements of celebration that we could bring into the tapestry, you discovered that, you know, in Japanese culture, Boys Day, May, May 5th, which is also yeah. Cinco de Mayo. And it's sort of like, you know, we share so much more, whether it's even a date, you know, on a calendar, these cultures come together in unexpected ways. And I think that you mentioned the kind of like this kind of intersectionality and this idea that that sometimes we don't have the opportunity to to experience that. But I, I would say that we don't if we stand still, you know, but if you simply were to walk across, you know, a few neighborhoods in Los Angeles or drive or however you might traverse the city, you actually picking up all of these these culturally specific elements you know whether it's kind of you know seeing a arabic script on a building you know followed by you know um a korean kind of sign you know or the smell of you know tamales kind of on the street corner these various things are all out there and i think that as you move across los angeles you you can't avoid it you know you experience it and you realize that you're not kind of in a vacuum or a bubble um but in the co course of covid where people you know are more kind of inside it's nice to kind of give a reminder that you know we're we're here in a shared space which is nice and to bring it visually together in a shared space is really powerful and, and you mentioned the armenian kind of culture and there's like one of my favorite little touches are these little stuffed Armenian figures that, that are, you know, we decided to just not have them on their own, but to have them kind of floating on another, you know, other pieces, whether it's a piñata or like a Mexican kind of paper lantern. And I think that, I think it's really, yeah, it's really beautiful and poetic to be able to like share, show that, that it's like in a way this little Armenian, this bit of Armenian culture is there floating and kind of, you know, in a way we're supporting each other, you know, and there's pieces in the canopy that are, the, the weight of them are supported by others and the balance that comes into play, you know, that these kind of giant Chinese lanterns, you know, they, they, they wouldn't stay balanced if it were not for other pieces of the kind of uh, canopy. So, yeah, it's really beautiful to be able to see that and, and kind of illustrates that, that inner connectivity that we all have. Yeah, no, and I think that it's been nice for people to kind of like find different pieces that that's kind of surprised them, you know, because um, there's also so much color in the piece. Um, so just, you know, like while we were there installing and stuff um, before we left, just seeing different different people take their pictures with things that matched just the outfits that they had on or, you know, people being able to kind of take ownership of the space. And um, I think that's what was like really, really awesome to see like the space in use and to see like how it suddenly like this artwork became really kind of functional um, and really open, you know, open to like interpretation, but also just open for anybody to kind of take ownership of it and to do whatever it was that made them happy or made them feel good um, inside that space. And it's a spontaneous, I mean, I was down there again yesterday and in the morning 
we we open there's a sonic component to the celebration tapestry to this canopy that is a 12 hour continuous dj mix but from 24 different djs and the the day opens every morning at 10 a.m with a mix from Davina Two Bears, who um, hosts a show called The Indigenous Voice on Dub Lab on our nonprofit radio station. And so I, I asked Davina, I, I invited her to participate in the project, but really this idea of kind of a, a musical land acknowledgement, you know, that each morning we're welcoming people to the space, but to understand that we're, we're all guests, you know, in this space, you know, people might have indigenous roots, you know, there, all of that is so mixed and, and blurred too. But like, I think that we're, we're, we're guests, you know, we want to try to be, when you're a guest somewhere, you want to try to be the best you can be. And I think that it's a reminder of like, you're coming to this space that, that others were here before you and let's all coexist in a good way. But hearing this music that was native California, indigenous Los Angeles music, Tongva music, Chumash music was really moving. And I saw, a sheriff, you know, moving through the space. I saw somebody who was likely a law clerk moving through the space, the unhoused population and, and all of these people just being there, you know, mingling in a space and, and looking up, you know, which often we're also, you know, in stressful and anxious moments, we're often like looking down like this, you know, you're sort of like kind of grounded by the gravity of it or like compressed by the gravity of it. And I think that it's just also simply beautiful to kind of encourage people to kind of like look up, you know, because you also see through the canopy, you know, the, the other element that's at play is the city, you know, and the nature and the clouds kind of moving over. So it's so beautiful to see a Chinese, you know, lantern next to an Armenian stuffed figure next to a Filipino, like a, a handmade Filipino decoration and see the clouds kind of moving above or see the wind kind of shaking and, when you move down to the next section of the the installation which is really the the after party you know the the city and the environment in a way is playing because we've hung uh, wind chimes in the trees and bells and gongs and and that you can actually hear the nature of los angeles the environment expressed sonically in a sonic way but collaged with a very more intentional healing relaxing ambient uh audio installation from leaving records who are so focused in community work and equity through sound and so to be in that space again like a lot of that stuff people can read you know the the, the signage but they might not and that's fine you know like as long as they kind of find some joy in a moment of moving through a space of you know spontaneity and 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 yeah healing and a spark of joy is is really uh what what's brought to it. Tanya, what do you, what do you miss in the past kind of year? I mean, all, so much of this is focused on celebration and joy and you're somebody who's such a, by nature, a social person and a community builder and a community connector for you. Is there something that, that you've been kind of hoping to get back to um, and that you think you'll come out of this as an artist? Like, is there a new part of your practice, your voice that's been fortified by, the momentary pause and, and as much social interaction? I'm, I mean, I'm mainly, I guess, just looking forward to family gatherings. You know, I, I'm, yeah. much as I'm super social, um, you know, I like, am like held together by like my strong foundation of, you know, having my sisters close by and being able to like spend time with them and, um, so I'm really excited for, yeah, just for all of us to be able to start gathering with like our like really close loved ones, you know, and to be able to like hug and like hold hands and not be afraid anymore and cook together and stuff like that. Um, and I think that honestly, like that pandemic and, and that being so isolated or so um, like depending on, I guess, like really tiny, tiny, tiny community, but not being able to like, to be with everybody um, has made me really appreciate, yeah, just like the beauty of, of like closeness um, yeah. and of having a community, you know, and 
the studio had to like really severely downsize and it was a place where a lot of community could gather and a lot of us could work together and support one another and kind of help each other through a lot of like mental health issues while we made stuff together. Um, so I think that hopefully, um, you know, once we start to, to be able to kind of come out of this, um, that we can like maintain the appreciation for, um, for community, you know? Yeah. I mean, those, those kind of elemental sort of family celebrations that in a way you take for granted because often certain things come around every year. There's the special ones, whether it be a wedding or a baptism or a bar mitzvah that might be, you know, uh, less frequent in, in life, but there's the ones that are the recurrent. So many traditions have an annual kind of recurrent, you know, celebration. And I think that that feeds you know, whatever your your kind of focus in life, your practice, your artistic practice, or your just kind of uh, priorities in life, it it's sort of like a positive feedback loop. You kind of come back to the family, and you're fed and nourished by that time together, and the the celebrations mm -hmm. being those moments of reflection to to kind of like be in the moment, but also look at those moments over the course of years. You know, and and so it's interesting to kind of think about getting back to that. You know, with Dub Lab being a radio station a lot of in a way music kind of lives in the ether you know it's it's something that's invisible unless it's made visible unless a you know a band is playing it or unless you see a vibration across water or something you know it's it's invisible and radio is in the airwaves but it's really also fed by by connection at least the, the our brand of radio you know our our kind of way of uh, kind of crafting it is is to express connections and communities and our studio has been closed for you know a year and a half and on one hand it's been really powerful because we've been able to kind of have content created in a more widespread manner from living rooms from bedrooms all around the world you know and to be able to actually increase you know it's a it's a form of expression that actually is is very powerful in this time because you can like create these things and have them then shared and broadcast to others but but we so miss just the conversations in the studio those musical moments you know kind of mm -hmm. like of, of sharing you know the the your your own input and your own experience and being able to have that crossfade with somebody else to create something new. Can you talk a little more about in your studio, you mentioned this idea of the actual, almost like the, the communal practice of creating something. And and you mentioned the idea of the kind of like the, the beneficial kind of mental health, you know, uh, output of that, of being together with people making art and, and the, the process of that. Yeah, um, in a lot of the work that I do, I like over the years figured out that um, I really like working with people from different backgrounds and um, main, mainly with like femme identified people. And I really love um, like us being able to create without a sense of like up or down, like wrong or right. Um, and like kind of have figured out ways to strip a lot of, um, I guess, like preciousness from the way that that we work together um, because that allows kind of like more open access for people to intervene into it and for people to kind of also take ownership of, of making something communally. Um, and so for the studio, a lot of like the way that, that we make is kind of like tapping into your intuition and allowing your hands to speak like their own handwriting. Um, so everybody has, everyone that like comes into the studio to help or to, to work um, has their own like rhythm to the way that they make things. Um, so some people, me and I work a lot in fiber and mainly in fiber. Um, everybody has like a different like tension and like looseness or like way that they kind of express themselves through their body. Um, and so that that's really reflected in, um, in the way that we make like large scale woven pieces and, um, 
and also in, in community-based projects. Um, so a lot of the stuff is about... Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but it's beautiful because we're seeing on the screen uh, you kind of being encased with felt there, which is very yeah. hand and, and body on. Totally. Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of it is kind of figuring out ways of using like craft-based materials and like craft-based processes um, to allow kind of a more like, yeah, like a more openness to the way that, um, that not just art is made, but the way that art is experienced. Amazing. I mean, I think we hold, you know, if you're working, you're stressed on a project and you're hunched over your laptop, which I'm talking about myself often, you know, you're here and you're holding at, you know, the, the rare times where I treat myself to going, having a massage or the self care of going to acupuncture. And, you know, it's like going to the dentist and are like, be sure to floss. That happens, you know, every time I go But the acupuncture, I was saying, you know, you hold your stress here. And I think we all hold our stress in different parts of ourselves. And it's almost like physically these things are locked in us, you know, but do you see it as a form of release or a form of kind of like kind of unlocking these physical traumas or physical or joys, you know, things that you're, that you're expressing uh, outputting from yourself? Yeah, I definitely see it as both. You know, sometimes it depends on um, on the like subject matter of the piece or the ideas behind like the the initial like concept or even like the call. Um, like specific, um, you know, exhibitions are about like really specific things, and then some of those things can kind of like re-trigger some traumas, and then like through that. Um, and like working with community members that are from like similar communities, we kind of then explore, you know, ways of, of healing through making and healing through sharing. Um, and then other times it's just kind of allowing yourself to just make without thinking. And then that in itself yeah. could be, you know, a form of release. And, and it's, yeah, like I still think of a lot of pieces kind of like cooking where you know once you kind of let go of like being super controlling over your hands and over you know what's coming out of you um then you kind of can open up to to talking with other people about you know oh this is something i've been thinking about or oh you know and so then that's how how we end up kind of sharing a lot and um and kind of strengthening the community um of those of us working and also collaborating together um, yeah, so it's kind of just this like really beautiful, happy place um, a lot of times. And then sometimes it's a really difficult place, um, especially yeah. if we're dealing with issues of, you know, of death and, um, you know, a lot of border border issues that I deal with in my work and in a lot of my um, involvements with community at the border. A lot of it is just working through really heavy, heavy things um, that are like, you know, really legitimately like life and death situations for people. And so then, yeah. you know, while like doing that stuff, there's also like a need for just kind of working with my hands and letting things just be and work themselves out. And so I think that's where a lot of, you know, like it acts as a little release valve um, for just kind of focusing on like togetherness and beauty and, and not thinking so much about, um, the heaviness of what's going on uh, in our communities. Yeah, there's some beautiful images that are floating on the screen of the Ambos project that, that we just saw. And, um, you know, I saw, I actually, in in preparing for this, I was kind of going back through and revisiting some of the Ambos project. And I, I saw, you know, a picture of my wife with a smile on her face, you know, working on a piece at your studio. And the, she's in conversation with you and you're seeing these little hubs of people kind of in conversation and, and or just focused on the work. And there's a really incredible communal aspect to it that, you know, you're great at, you, you have a vision, but that vision is open for involvement and participation from mm -hmm. others. Uh, where I think that you mentioned this idea of kind of like the collaborators taking ownership over like, you know, a piece of it, even like, energetically mm -hmm. or even like I tied that knot you know like I wove that piece I was involved and it's a really 
it's a beautiful way of participation yet vision. You know, it's sort of a coexistence of those two things. There's an image from Ambos, you know, where, and, and I'd love for you to actually maybe to, to describe what Ambos is, but also there's this image that's on your site that the border wall is there and you're actually weaving a piece between two sides. You know, you're sitting on one side of uh, the border and somebody's on the other side and this weaving is happening through this kind of wall, which is, it's just, you know, you immediately are, are, are kind of, you get it, but it also goes deeper too. But can you explain what Ambos is and, um, and, and maybe what that piece was? Yeah, um, so Ambos stands for Art Made Between Opposite Sides. And it's a project that I started, that I founded in 2016. And at the beginning it was, you know, I, I was thinking of it just as like a one-off project um, where we were gonna activate the, the border crossing space in San Isidro, which is the part of um, the border that I crossed every day to go to school in the US um, because I grew up in Tijuana and didn't move over here until I was 18 um, or didn't move to the US until I was 18. Um, and so I thought a lot about like how stigmatized our community is and how a lot of us don't talk about, um, you know, like being caught kind of between two spaces and kind of not belonging to either and um, being looked down upon by the US and like, anyways. So in the beginning, it was just a place for us to kind of um, like be able to, to visualize um, the connection between the two sides, but then also, I guess, how we bridge the two sides um, and be able to check in with people and, and make sure that they're okay. Um, mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, you know, I felt like, especially as a child, like I just needed somebody to ask me if I was okay. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, and so then it was, I started it during uh, the first, when, um, when Trump was running the first time and he was saying so many bad things about Mexicans. And so I just wanted to check in. And then, so I invited different artists um, from LA, San Diego and Tijuana um, to activate the space and to think of different projects that they wanted to do that kind of spoke about our interconnectedness, um, but then also a place for us to have dialogues about, you know, where there are differences, where, you know, there's differences between, you know, like Mexican, Mexican American and Chicano identities you know, and why it is that we don't talk about those things. Um, and then after seeing kind of how powerful it was to um, just ask people their opinion and to ask somebody what they think or ask somebody to share um, a little bit about their emotion in their life and to empower them to, you know, like kind of deconstruct what the idea of art is, you know, by asking people through this one project called The Border Kipu, um, we approached um, vendors, people in their car, people walking, taxi drivers, anybody that pretty much like makes a living um, in proximity to the border. Uh, on the Mexican side, we asked them to make a knot that was symbolic of their emotional state um, in relation to the border. And then all of those were tied together to make these large um, sculptural pieces that visualized our relationship to each other um every single day that we that we did it and so you know just having people participate and and them saying oh no but i don't know how to make art no 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 i can't i don't know how to make a knot and you know letting them know that like even a tiny thing like tying a knot can be art like art can be anything and it can be anything that any of us want it to be um was just such a amazing thing to be able to see people kind of you know, changing the way that they think of, about what art can be and that it can be something participatory and it can be something that's actually really reflective of our own lives. Um, and so then, yeah, it ended up, so it ended up becoming a really massive project where we spent three years zigzagging up and down the entirety of the U.S.-Mexico border and documenting um, the art that was made up both sides, uh, making community with people along the whole, the whole border um documenting the fence and how life was at the border at either side um and then again asking people how they feel um and having them participate in the border people um and so when it was appropriate and when we felt safe 
Um, we would do interventions at the border fence, either with each other, with each other as, as team members and collaborators and, and sisters um, as part of the AMPOS project, which was um, primarily um, the, the core group is all women. And um, when possible and when we felt inclined to, then we would also do um, collaborations with other artists at the border. And so the piece that you're speaking of is a weaving, a backstrap weaving between me and Jackie Mesquita, uh, who's a, a Guatemalan artist that lives in LA, who's a good friend of mine and um, part of the Ambos project. And so and we had who's, both- uh, collaborated with Grand Park during the Dia de los Muertos, made an yes. amazing piece in the mountain there. Yes, exactly. So uh, Jackie is an incredible, incredible artist. Um, and so, you know, we, because we both like to kind of do like a lot of like endurance kind of pieces and use our body as a way of also kind of um, creating art. We had both learned to backstrap weave um, from Mayan women. She had learned um, in, in um, Guatemala and I had learned in Chiapas. And so both of us kind of have this connection to each other where, you know, we're really interested in fiber. Um, but we're really interested in like what Are you backstrap weaving. Can you simply explain what that what that is? So people understand. Yeah, so it's a, a like pre-Columbian way of weaving um, where you tie yourself to an, a central like object, like a pole or a tree, something that's stable. Um, and you tie the loom, which is what the, the weavings are made on. Um, and then you stretch your body and then you do like a back and forth movement to give tension to the warp so that you're able to actually um, create a fabric, create like something solid. And so we both like the idea of, you know, what tying yourself to something means, um, what it means to, to be kind of like bifurcated between these two sides because of the fence. Um, what it means for, you know, this fence to be both something that like exists in our, in our subconscious and in our like, in our mind, but it's also such a physical thing and it, and it has such, um, such a violence to it. Um, and so we wanted to do something where we could do something through the fence, but you're not allowed to pass anything through the fence. You're not allowed to touch through the fence. And so um, luckily we were able to do this piece in one part of the border um, that felt really safe for us to do this. And so we did it in like in, in like plain view of the border patrol um, who was, he drove away to give us space and he knew that um, we were kind of, you know, going through a lot of like emotions and trauma and that there was a lot for us um, like in that and in the fence and the physicality of the fence and in our connection to each other. Um, and so, yeah, so we were tied to each other, weaving with our bodies, um, holding the tension so that we could each support each other through the middle of the fence. I mean, this idea of support, you know, and although there's, there's, there's a physicality that at points could be, I imagine, uncomfortable, it's also incredible to kind of, and the surveillance there you know and i think in general on the kind of water area there's both surveillance and simple pleasures you know might feel anxiety and fear you know but you also then might smell like the kind of hot cinnamon and sugar from a fresh churro moving by your window and like be able to kind of access all these things but you're through this work creating something really beautiful as well and something that is transcendent um speaks to the moment and to so much of identity but also has a transcendence to it. And I think that, yeah, it's, it's interesting. In the Ambos project, I had the, the pleasure and honor to, to be one time there on the border crossing and be able to DJ and be part of this intervention. And, and my wife was wor uh, uh, working with you and, and these young children in the, the border in San Ysidro. And, and how far a little moment of joy, like an extension of joy, you know, to somebody mm -hmm. goes, like how that is is it can be understated you know it's so powerful and so i think that you know through work that can go deep and think deeply you can also you know that deepness can also be about joy and kind of transmitting joy and and it's really wonderful with all your work that you know so multi-layered 
and is moving with the moment as you're evolving and as the world's evolving and bringing people in a conversation and connection together. Um, but also, you know, this, this, yeah, humanity and joy that exists in all of it. And it's been nice to collaborate on this project and celebration spectrum and, and, you know, kind of see that, that, that kind of full kind of expanse of what you do, you know, moves through different worlds and engages with people on different levels. And it's wonderful. Speaking of engaging with people, we have just a couple of minutes left and, and Oaxaca, uh, Oaxaca is calling the, the elements, the thunder, lightning, rain, uh, parades on the street are maybe now tucked into kind of like storefronts as well as, you know, the uh, beautiful cuisine and drink and everything. But um, yeah, it's it's been so fun to collaborate and be in conversation. If anybody's on Facebook and wants to get one question in, we're here and we're welcome to answer that. Otherwise, we can always feel free to type in the comments and we'll uh, uh, retroactively uh, uh, chime in. Uh, but we have a, a thank you for being open and sharing, Tanya, which is very true. You are open and sharing. That's one of your greatest kind of uh, traits and characteristics which we thank. Uh, and, you know, I think I, I wanted to just say again, you know, the Grand Park is really central place. It's one of the few central places the Los Angeles has where you have a convergence of so many different people who are in so many different kind of moments of their, their life. And I think that we can't define, you know, as people are trying to present something artistically, you can't define where the viewer is coming to you, like what point they're coming to you, just know that they're ever changing and shifting. All you can do is let go and all kind of an expression and hope that somebody kind of finds some joy in it. And I think that especially, you know, again, the the growing unhoused population, you know, in Los Angeles and something that I think hopefully all of us can come together and help support and find, you know, good permanent solutions, you know, for this that are, are uh, that are sustainable and supportive. But I think to be able to have a space like this that is really kind of democratizes the viewer and the listener and, and, and knows that, you know, anybody, wherever you are, whoever you are, you're all coming to it, you know, on an equal level, in a, but in a different way, you know, and that's really beautiful. So I hope that if people have a chance to come down to that space, you know, we're not pushing people out of experiences. We're trying to bring them into the experience and trying mm -hmm. to kind of mix it up and, and uh, offer hopefully a reflection of uh, what people, you know, um, throughout Los Angeles are feeling. That's, you know, there's, there's a lot of pain in the joy, you know, there's a lot of catharsis and, you know, being able to reflect on a celebration missed, but also a lot of opportunity. I want to offer people the opportunity to actually really be involved in it. If you visit dublab.com slash celebration, we're, we're almost in the, we're in the kind of, you know, kind of uh, in stretch of the, the installation, but we do have through the end of the month, but you can submit photos of your pre pandemic celebrations. And we love to see the way that you celebrate. You know, if you come from a specific cultural heritage that, you know, there's a celebration that's important to you send us a photo we love to put it on a projection in the space and in a beautiful framing and to show people you know a little glimpse into your life into your community so dublab.com celebration is a place to uh, to be able to share that um and yeah thank you for uh, celebrating with us thank you tanya for you know you're mm -hmm. you're traveling and um you know enjoying your your kind of uh your, your space down there. I know that in your travels, um, again, it's like, it can be pleasurable, but you're also as an artist, always thinking, you know, and you're, you're engaging with people wherever you are and kind of take them in. Um, for you, what's kind of next in, in your kind of, you know, your world and your kind of uh, travels or has there been something in Oaxaca you've seen that has kind of uh, re-sparked or reignited a specific kind of element of joy within you? Um, yeah, no, I right now am like totally surrounded by a bunch of really, really beautiful clay um, and I've been able, been lucky enough to be able to go visit a lot of different um, villages that work with, with clay and that are all, you know, like community based where everybody's kind of helping each other get by. Um, but then also like a lot of um, like 
witnessing just a lot of really, really amazing ways that people are thinking about land, um, that people are sharing, um, that people are like helping each other, like learn different things. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm just kind of like reminded of of how yeah, just how amazing it is to be able to to work together with other people um and to find inspiration in like in each other and in like exploring and having adventures together um and so i think being here has made me really excited about working with clay again um and it's also been um i've been spending a lot of time um while well, here i mean i've only i'm only here for five days i go back home to la tomorrow um, but I'm here kind of on this journey with my friend um, who turned 50 and that's why we're here. Um, just kind of taking like a deeper dive into um, like care for self, like self care, self reflection, um, like ways to nurture like your soul, ways to connect with, um, you know, c to connect and learn um, from like our ancestors and yeah no i'm like going back to la with a lot of like really incredible um like food for thought for um how we can help remind each other um that we belong to each other that you know that that we embody like so many generations of our families um experiences and that they all like still live within us and and kind of help us and guide us through everything that we do so yeah, so just kind of thinking a lot about um, yeah, our like deeper connection to to each other um, and and how it all like flows within us. That's so wonderful. Well, I'm excited. I know that you're constantly flowing on that creative continuum, and you're gonna uh, bring back and give back, you know, in such a great way. I urge everybody to uh, to visit. You know, we welcome you down to the celebration spectrum. I was down there again yesterday, and it looks so beautiful. And I was I was finding new moments within a familiar installation. Um, you can visit whywerise.la for more information. And um, again, we welcome you down there. Here, uh, Grand Park uh, Digital Program. Next week, we're doing a, a great uh, conversation called Audible Identities. I'll be joined by Ana Luisa Petrisco, who um, is part of the Celebration Tapestry, uh, very much an incredible multidimensional artist uh, um, with uh, uh, roots, uh, Filipino roots, and like just phenomenal uh, expressive artist, Maral, who's a dub lab DJ, musician, producer, who's also part of Celebration Tapestry um, and uh, reflected a Persian American springtime renewal mix. Um, as well as Shandao, Alexandra Lipman, who's one of the founders of Discos Rolas. That's a brand new record label focused on cumbia sonidera culture and uh, bridging Los Angeles and uh, Mexico and beyond through that music. Uh, a professor, uh, ethnomusicologist, and just a, a great human, a dub up DJ as well. I'll be in conversation with these three women who are doing such incredible work, and that'll be next Thursday, March 27th. And I hope you can join us. And thank you, Tanya, for uh, for being here. Thanks to the Grand Park team so for uh, all of you. Yeah, it's so fun. <laughs> and I guess before and before we go, um, yeah, just want to remind people. So yeah, so it's still going on until May until May thirty first. Um, and then there's gonna be um, some special surprises um, that we're gonna be working on um, that won't be announced, but there'll be a lot of um, a lot of more gifts to the community and, and to LA um, that hopefully people can be a part of. And um, but yeah, it's this is your this is your installation, this is your your piece, and and you are all welcome to be a part of it. Yes, indeed. Come on down. Thank you, everybody. Uh, adios, good night. Uh, and uh, yes. wherever you are in this world, enjoy. Peace. <laughs> Bye. Stay safe.